Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the COVID-19 Executive Roundtable webinar. My name is Keenan James, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. We'll take a couple brief moments to allow attendees to enter the room, and then we'll get started shortly. First, we'd like to thank FirstNet by AT&T for sponsoring tonight's webinar. Good evening, and welcome to the first in a series of virtual roundtable discussions brought to you by the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, NOBLE. This evening's webinar is sponsored by FirstNet, built by AT&T. On behalf of NOBLE and our partners at FirstNet, thank you for attending. My name is Keena James. I serve as the Deputy Director and will be tonight's moderator. This evening, we have a group of distinguished public safety leaders who will engage in a conversation centered on law enforcement's response to COVID-19 pandemic. The panel includes Sarah Lynn C.J. Davis, Noble National President, Chief of Police in Durham Police Department, Sean Ferguson, Superintendent for the New Orleans Police Department, Roberto Hilton, Director of Law Enforcement and Engagement and Integration with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and Mary Leffridge Bird, Federal Security Director, State of Georgia, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Transportation Security Administration, and Sheriff Gary McFadden of Mecklenburg County, North Carolina. We will discuss the tragedies and triumphs, protective equipment, and protecting personnel. Finally, we include you, our audience, in our discussion during the question and answer portion. For most of you, there's a toolbar located on your screen where you can type your question to send to the panelists. Questions will be added to our queue and answered during our Q&A portion later during tonight's roundtable. If your question is directed to one of the specific panelists, please include that panelist's name in your question. All telephones and computer microphones are muted so that all of our attendees can clearly hear our panelists. Following tonight's discussion, you will receive a survey to rate your experience. We ask that you take two minutes to complete that survey to help us better deliver an experience to you. On behalf of the 3,000 plus members of Noble, thank you for tuning in to this important discussion. We will start tonight's roundtable hearing from our Noble National President, Chief of Police in Durham, North Carolina. Chief C.J. Davis has more than 32 years of dedicated service in the law, enforce, law enforcement profession. Known for her emphasis on employee wellness, community engagement, and efficient police operations, she is the first African-American woman to lead the Durham Police Department. Prior to coming to Durham, Chief Davis served for 30 years with the Atlanta Police Department, where she learned the essential elements of community engagement and relationship building. An advocate for the advancement of women in her field, Chief Davis has used her experience in leadership acumen to leverage mentoring relationships for women in a variety of career fields. In August of 2019, Chief Davis was sworn in as the 42nd president of Noble. After serving the organization for more than 20 years, President Davis's priorities for Noble have been criminal justice reform, community engagement initiatives, and reducing gun violence. Chief Davis, welcome. Thank you. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining Noble tonight in this most important and timely conversation regarding the coronavirus and the devastating toll it has had on communities that we serve, and also the challenges uh, we now face as law enforcement professionals. 
I believe that in the days ahead, we will see that uh, law enforcement and policing as we know it will never be the same again. So on behalf of the Noble National Board and the leadership team at Noble, we look forward to hearing uh, these various perspectives uh, related to COVID-19 from some of the, the most highly respected uh, professionals in the industry, my friends and my colleagues that are here. I'm so glad that you accepted the invitation. And of course, we can't wait to hear from our audience as well, your questions, your input, and your statements. So again, thank you. And I look forward to having a robust discussion tonight. Chief Davis, how are you experiencing and, and handling the challenges of COVID-19 there in Durham? Well, um, you know, I think uh, the first thing I had to realize that there was no playbook for this. Uh, even though uh, I think we all have had a myriad of experiences um, in our careers, uh, we've had um, training and all kinds of emergency response and NIMS and CBURN, and we knew what a biological attack was. The difference here is that we have an event that could have been a biological attack, but it just didn't go away. There was no end to the attack. There, there is just this ongoing type of emergency state that, that we have to remain in. So uh, trying to, to get my officers um, acclimated to the new norm, you know, wearing the mask, um, not, uh, you know, causing fear in the community too, because people are thinking they're gonna get arrested. We've got all these different orders out. So um, it's been a challenge, especially as it relates to what we are accustomed to doing every day and, and just shifting gears and looking at public safety from, you know, a holistic standpoint. Awesome. Awesome. We appreciate that insight and input. And I know some of the communities and have heard different comments regarding safety and personal safety uh, with wearing masks. And then how does that perception uh, is there? Uh, even an unconscious bias that may be there uh, within our communities for having to wear a mask out into the public. And so how will we look at those uh, challenges that we face those in the, in the coming months? I appreciate that insight on there. Superintendent Ferguson down in New Orleans. Sir, how are you doing? Good, sir, and yourself? Excellent, excellent. Just give you a little bit of background. Superintendent Sean Ferguson is a 20 plus year veteran of the New Orleans Police Department. Born in a native of New Orleans, raised in the Ninth Ward, he has served the department as a district commander and commander of the Education and Training Division. New Orleans, like many cities, has experienced some disproportionately high number of deaths of African Americans as a result of COVID-19. There may even be impacts within your department. Uh, Superintendent Ferguson, thanks for joining us this evening. What can you give us some insight on regarding uh, your management and what's going on down in New Orleans? First of all, let me start by saying thank you, Madam President, for inviting me to be a part of this very, very prestigious uh, panel. I'm, I'm, I'm honored and blessed to be here with you all. Uh, New Orleans, we are dealing with something that's very unique, as the president said. Uh, you know, uh, Mardi Gras seems to have put us at ground zero, as ground zero for the state of Louisiana, for the South period. So everyone has put pretty much their focus on us and what is it that we are doing? Uh, what could we be doing uh, to get out of this? Uh, we had our first case uh, March 9th, uh, and this is week eight. Uh, we were predicted to be uh, at approximately 600 or more deaths by now, but um, luckily, and still not so much luckily, but we are just over 400 deaths in New Orleans. So uh, while we can claim a victory by having 200 less arrests, and I, I I mean, I'm sorry, arrest less debts. I commend uh, what we are doing as a team. I commend my mayor for her leadership and what we're doing with our public health department, as well as our safety and permits in the men and women of our department and how we are starting to flatten that curve because of the social distancing uh, deployment that we are putting out and everything that we are putting into place. We will actually see it working here in New Orleans faster than what we kind of expected it. So while we're celebrating a win of having 200 less debts, we still had one too many debts with 400 plus. But uh, nevertheless, we still continue to press forward. Our governor just uh, issued a new mandate on yesterday, effective March, I'm sorry, May 1st, he will be uh, implementing uh, what we call phase zero 
Uh, where he's going to start having some of the restaurants open up along the sidewalk for outdoor uh, dining and things of that nature. But here in New Orleans, we're going to continue what we have been doing until May 16th. Uh, and we are not going to allow that to happen just yet. And we're going to continue to emphasize and focus on social distancing, continue to focus on staying at home. Uh, we being uh, the mecca of being the what Louisiana is built on in New Orleans, we understand how important we are to our state and we must maintain this and stay focused on what we need to get do to get through this process. Thank you, Superintendent. Just thinking about the stay at home order and, and lots of those are all across the country. What are you seeing as far as crime trends uh, with people staying at home? Has there been a, a change, a dip in crime? Has there been a rise, no change at all? How has crime or public safety been impacted by the stay at home order? For the most part, we had seen it, it was it was staying consistent. Uh, but when uh, about week three or week four, we started recognizing that we had a spike in res uh, in business burglaries. Uh, made a few arrests with that, uh, then that trended down. But now we're starting to see the violence pick up. Uh, and that my concern is, I think the criminal element is starting to see or recognize there isn't that much of a law enforcement interaction or engagement as a result of everyone's social distancing. And, and, and as such, the, the criminal element has become a little bit bolder. And now we're starting to see an increase in our homicides as well as our shootings. Chief Davis, are you seeing a similar trend uh, in Durham as well? Well, you know, uh, I think the first week or two, we got excited we, because crime. <laughs> just completely just went away you know we were thinking that you know, even though this is a very devastating thing it's having a weird impact on crime it got quiet and that was the quiet before the storm things went right back to normal uh we do see a, a little bit of a shift uh as it relates to um you know violent crime in a sense even though we still have aggra aggravated assaults my property crimes as chief ferguson has said superintendent ferguson has said uh, property crimes have gone up we've had an uptick and you know, um, vehicle vehicle larcenies and also burglaries and um, and just larcenies in general, like shoplifting. You know, people who are not working and um, all kinds of the only thing left open are the stores. So people are just kind of floating in the stores and they're stealing groceries and going in the drug stores and th stealing things in the drug stores and, and and stuff like that. So um, we've seen a shift in the type of crimes. Understandable, understandable. As this is a national pandemic and we have a lot of things going on, I'd like to bring into the conversation Director Roberto Hilton of the Office of Law Enforcement Engagement and Integration with the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Director Hilton has an accomplished and decorated law enforcement professional career uh, and has brings significant expertise in initiating and cultivating relationships between agencies, organizations, and the community. An Army veteran, an Army and Marine Corps veteran uh, Director Hilton served as the police chief for Prince George's County, Maryland from 2008 to 2011. His policing repertoire incorporated the infusion of fusion centers, management accountability comp step processes, community response team, intelligence driven policing, and technology to aid in the daily delivery of policing services. Director Hilton, thanks for joining us for the conversation. And what can you tell us about FEMA, what you're seeing at that level, and your engagement with local and state agencies? Uh, good evening, and first of all, also thank you, uh, Madam uh, President, for this uh, invite. Uh, I'm honored to sit with such distinguished panelists also. Uh, you know, it's interesting, coming from an uh, operational uh, posture from policing and now being a, uh, a administrator within uh, FEMA, I'm beginning to understand that uh, law enforcement for many years have been somewhat kept out from being integrated into this emergency management system. Uh, like the uh, Chief Davis mentioned, uh, there's no playbook for this uh, pandemic. However, uh, FEMA uh, developed a new strategic plan. Unfortunately, uh, this pandemic is hidden uh, while we were in the process of in implementing this plan. This plan consists of three points. One, we're going to build a culture of preparedness. What that means is law enforcement and all the various disciplines, we have to learn to work together and understand all the various frameworks and policies and opportunities for funding uh, that exists that, it, that you can apply for these things prior to uh, an event. The second one is building a, 
uh, being prepared for the next catastrophic event. No one, not in my 40 years of uh, law enforcement experience, have I seen such a pandemic that has actually shut down the entire country. We can't use mutual aid. We can't use uh, certain funding. There's there's funding that's solely uh, dedicated to specific uh, uh, areas within this uh, within this emergency. And the third piece is reducing the complexities. I'm very uh, concerned regarding uh, what all of you have been concerned about uh, uh, PPEs. The federal government, uh, FEMA, does is not a repository for uh, PPEs. We provide support to the states and funding so that the states can actually buy these equipment. Why? Why the, fund, why the equipment and the PPEs are not reaching individual police departments in the numbers that they're supposed to, I don't know. Most of the uh, issues here, the uh, local law enforcement has to, deal with their, uh, has to deal with their emergency managers who are, who are responsible to make sure that you get these resources. So I'm, 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 I'm happy to be here. Uh, I wanna listen to some of your concerns and maybe, uh, maybe tonight I can respond to some of those. If not, I'll get the answers and get them back through Noble to the, uh, to the participants. That's excellent. We appreciate that insight. If there are any follow-up questions, you can send those, our audience members can send those to webinar at noblenatl.org. So if you do have follow-up questions at the conclusion of tonight's session, webinar at noblenatl.org, and we'll certainly do that. We've got some questions in coming in, and we'll make sure that we get to those questions. Uh, one of them uh, for Superintendent Ferguson asks, uh, wanted to know a little bit about COVID-19 and any human trafficking cases and if you're seeing any experiencing those individuals that may be uh, a part of human trafficking. Uh, we have not seen anything with regards to human trafficking uh, during this public health emergency, not, not, not as of yet. We did experience that during Mardi Gras. Uh, we partnered up with our state and federal partners, but right now we have not seen any specific uh, change or shift with regards to uh, human trafficking at all. Awesome. Thank you for that response. We want to now also bring into this conversation Mary Leffridge Bird. With a career spanning over 30 years as a corrections, public safety, and aviation security executive, mm -hmm. Director Mary Leffridge Bird has a is a proven leader of large, complicated organizations. She has established a reputation and track record of accomplishment and objectives achievement, workforce development, organizational success with demonstrated expertise in constituency building and meaningful stakeholding. As she leads the Transportation Security Administration's Atlanta team uh, at Maynard Holbrook Jackson International Terminal, uh, they oversee 48,000 pieces of checked luggage and 70,000 originating passengers through 55 screening lanes and six security checkpoints. Oh. That's quite a task. Uh, Director Bird, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, certainly probably seeing some differences there at the airport uh, with your team and kind of how security and screening processes and procedures are going. What can you offer us as some insight as we deal with this pandemic from your perspective? Um, as has happened with my colleagues, I too want to thank uh, Chief Davis for the invitation to participate this evening. Such a critical conversation and COVID-19 is presenting such a unique challenge as has already been mentioned. Um, and while the challenges might be unique to TSA, these are shared, there's mutuality, I think, in terms of what it is we're dealing with, beginning with the safety uh, of our employees. And, and as well, the mission requirements have not changed in terms of our face-to-face -face contact with the public. So that's also a shared challenge that we, uh, that we experience. Uh, constant changes in terms of taking time to refine to intel all of the information. There's so much competing information and insights that are uh, with which we're being bombarded and understanding how that filters to the front line is, I think, very, very important. And we have to keep all of that sorted out. I've never seen so many pop up experts in my entire career. So everyone has a um, has an objective and thinks that their way is the way to get this done. Absent our mutuality in terms of our partnerships, we'll never get to the other side of this. And I'm certain that we will, even in spite of the force field of information that comes our way constantly. And so holding on to those uh, cornerstones that have really helped spirit us in these positions, beginning with recognition and respect for and communication and contact with the frontline workforce. 
And I have said to the officers, of which there are over 1,000 here in the state of Georgia, so now we're responsible for eight airports, Atlanta and the other uh, seven spoke airports around the state. I know them alphabetically, and if you stop me, I'll never be able to identify those spoke <laughs> airports. But it is really um, interesting when I have conversations with staff to remind that uh, while this is a new normal, getting to the other side of this means that COVID has moved in. It's not visiting. It will forever be a part of how we do what we do. So certainly there are changes in our uh, SOPs. There are changes in how passengers process through the uh, security screening. Um, that's necessary to keep planes in the air, obviously. When we began to walk this journey, we were seeing, as has been mentioned, about 70,000 originating passengers daily. We now see between three and 4,000 passengers. So keeping the uh, frontline rally to the mission is one of the most challenging things, but we've been successful having to do with their commitment, their understanding and their expertise as aviation security professionals. So I consider myself an operations executive and enjoy being out on the floor with officers and with the other staff who move this mission every single day. So I continue to rely on partnerships and certainly on colleagues who are um, who are in this fight. So thank you for uh, for your support and your appreciation of the work that happens in these airports. Thank you, Director Bird. Appreciate that. And then I have a question for you to follow up on, and as well as for uh, Chief Davis, uh, uh, Superintendent Ferguson, and I'll even say to Sheriff Evo, you haven't jumped in there quite yet. We'll bring you into the conversation. But one of the questions uh, that we received has to do with uh, personnel, your personnel, if they've been diagnosed and them returning to work, how are you handling sick personnel and their return to work? And so I'll start uh, with uh, Chief Davis, then I'll go to Superintendent Ferguson, and then uh, just curious also kind of at the airport and with, with the TSA personnel uh, with Director Byrd. Chief Davis? Um, yes, uh, I, I do believe that not just our agency, but most agencies have established protocols on how to uh, protect, protect the confidentiality of their employees as it relates to COVID-19. And, and that's what we try to do every day as it relates to uh, medical issues with our employees. But um, our human resources uh, department has helped us establish a protocol where they are really the intermediary for the conversation between the employee and the hospital so that my staff doesn't have to get involved and get in the middle of what's going on with, with a particular employee. So what I hear is I have a person that um, either has symptoms or tested, and then I don't really talk to that person at any point any further, they go through a process of being vetted through some other individual, some other professional to make sure that they have the support that they need, um, the, the quarantining environment that they need, um, the exams, the tests, all of the above. And then once they clear that, they go through that individual who then uh, sends me a check off and say, this individual is ready to come back to work. So we basically stay out of it. And our employees have been okay with that. Uh, they're getting the support that they need. And for us, the most important thing um, as it relates to the pandemic is you know, to test as quick as possible, to trace as quick as possible, and to separate. And if you slow down on any of those, you, you, you risk uh, infecting other individuals. So we're trying to make sure that we maintain quick protocols as it relates to testing, tracing, and separating. Superintendent, how about you? Yeah, same here. We have the, we have the same, uh, pretty much the same protocol established as Chief Davis. Uh, everything is going through our human resource. Uh, I have lost one officer, a reserve officer, and I have one currently in critical condition fighting for his life. He has been fighting for the last couple of weeks. Uh, but overall, 8% of our department has been impacted uh, by this. And when I say impacted, uh, either po test positive or flu-like symptoms where they're fall falling into that self-quarantine uh, process themselves before returning back to work. But over the last two weeks, we have seen a, a great uh, progress progression with we're now at approximately 20 officers that are out and we exceeded 100 at one point in time. So now we're at 20, but that decline, we have been seeing that decline for the last two weeks. So we know that we've reached or we've 
came over the, that hole or that curve per se, and now it's starting to flatten out for our offices as well as our community. And we just continue to push that same uh, momentum through our human resources that we're pushing with our community uh, to take care of yourself, as Chief said, testing. That, that separation is ideal. Even if you think you may have, uh, myself, going through Mardi Gras, I was asymptomatic. I feel that I was. I did not take the test. I never had any type of symptoms whatsoever. But I did separate myself from people. And, and now as I'm walking around, as I'm dealing with people, I am always wearing a mask just to make sure if I did, a, in case I do still, or someone else may have something, I'm not spreading anything. Awesome. Director Bird? Yeah, similarly, uh, we have a protocol that's been established by the agency through the Critical Incident Management Group, which is available to us seven days a week for 12 hours a day. And so it's a clearinghouse and also a provider of the equipment that we need in terms of PPE. But importantly, too, uh, the answers that we need relative to HR practices. So there is a parallel universe now relative to personnel practices, and we meet all of those standards. Um, unfortunately, we too lost uh, an officer superintendent. And so how we are engaging with our staff through this is so critical in terms of authenticity, transparency, the sensitivity and sensibility that goes along with not just managing the operation, but also proacting and responding to the needs, the emotional needs of uh, staff over this period of time. Uh, we've had sufficient numbers of PPE, which is a very fortunate thing. And because there are certain practices that need to change operationally, we lean on that critical incident management group, which is staffed by subject matter experts who are able to provide us direction and guidance. And when I say that this has become a known process now, I don't mean to suggest that it is rote because each experience with each officer or other employee is an individual experience. But we certainly do have the support and guidance that's necessary to ensure that our staff are safe and also to engage with our partners in ways that really builds the airport community. Um, so I think that's really important, but we don't, um, we don't, uh, we haven't thus far of the 14 officers and they all our officers. No, I'm sorry. There's one canine handler. We are so blessed that other than the officer we lost and we will walk with that in our heart and our heads for the balance of our careers. The other uh, officers are recovering at home and I do call them and I text them from time to time. Not so much that I could be arrested for her telephonic harassment, mm -hmm. but we stay in contact with them to let them know whatever your needs are during this period of time, please remember your full-time job right now is to get well, is to recover and to regain your strength. And we are right here with you. And we'll be here when you're ready to return to work with the appropriate clearances that have been provided by public health professionals. So. We look forward to welcoming those folks back to back to the workforce. Absolutely. Thank you, Director Bird. We'll also bring in Sheriff McFadden into the conversation. Just to give you some background, Sheriff Gary L. McFadden was elected to serve as the 45th Sheriff of Mecklenburg County. Prior to his election, Sheriff McFadden had a distinguished 36 year career in law enforcement with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, where he served for over 20 years as a legendary homicide detective. Sheriff McFadden's unconventional methods and deep ties to the community helped him solve hundreds of cases over the course of his illustrious career. As a detective, Sheriff McFadden had one of the highest solve rates in police department history, which led to him starring in his own television series, I Am Homicide. Sheriff McFadden can still be seen on the television series, Homicide City on Investigation Discovery. Sheriff McFadden is approaching his 40th year in law enforcement and is still committed to influencing change by leading the difference. Sheriff McFadden, thank you for joining us this evening. How are things in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina? How are things with the detention center? And certainly how are things with those sheriff's deputies that keep us safe? Sheriff McFadden, thank you for joining us this evening. How are things with the detention center? Well, thank you. Uh, this has been an exciting time for me and I wanna thank President Davis for allowing me to be a part of this wonderful distinguished group. Well, it is um, new for me. Um, I'm excited. I may have a different approach about this. Um, I saw the wave coming about February. And uh, me and several of the sheriffs here in North Carolina got together and said, there's a problem. And so I don't have a problem with finding PPE. You know, I, in my car now, I have 300 
KN95 KN mask that I have in my car. Um, I have a thousand masks in my office. So we started to um, buy and purchase these items in February and we were well stocked. Um, I have 20, 30 gallon drums of hand sanitizer. Where did we find that? Well, I got on the phone and start calling people and start preparing for this. So uh, it is not a playbook, but I can tell you now that I have a three punch hole um, puncher on my desk and I have a notebook. I am creating the playbook for the next time now. Anybody who's dealing with me now, I'm gonna find their phone number, their email address and says, next time, this is the book that I'm gonna pull off the shelf. Um, for my staff, we have a 3,000 bed facility. Um, we have about 1,500 um, residents. We don't call them inmates. There, we have not had one single case with our residents. We've only had two staff members, um, but they never entered the facility. One entered the facility and was stopped at screening, and the other one called us at home and said her mother was diagnosed, and so we told her to stay home. Both of those um, staff members will return next Friday to work. Neither have been in the hospital. I think this is a time that we have to look at leadership. I'm at my facility night and day, Saturday and Sunday, making sure that my staff is equipped and going forward. So we prepared for it. We have an unbelievable screening process that when you walk into our building, you get screened. I get screened every morning. You cannot enter our facility without getting screened. After being screened, we give you the color of the day wristband and you are to wear that wristband. And what we also did is have town hall meetings with our residents and our staff. And I mean, going inside the pods and sitting down and talking with the residents and say, if you see something, you say something. And I can tell you, even our residents do not like to see another detention officer come in that they haven't seen for two or three days. And they're not gonna have it and they're gonna report it to us. And also we have to um, ensure the public that we are doing everything for their loved ones that are housed inside our facilities. And actually I opened up an email address for mothers to call, to email me if they have a problem. But we also limited the visitation to our uh, facility. Unless you are an attorney, you do not enter our facility at this particular time, including contractors and everything else. So that has really helped us tremendously. Um, we're doing well. I hate to tell you all this. Today, I fed um, my staff 250 pieces that a company brought in just for a day of relaxing and the night shift got it too, but for us as leaders, they have to see us and do not see fear in our hearts and our minds. And I guarantee you that will help you along the way. Thank you, Sheriff. I appreciate that. I think you've given us a lot of, of things that are going on and talked about your detention center, which has certainly been a topic of discussion and on the minds of a lot of people, um, how you're managing that. So it sounds like you definitely have a plan, a strategy, and you're putting that to practice uh, one of the things you also mentioned was putting together the playbook. You're already designing and getting ready for when and if this should happen in the future. I think a lot of us uh, kind of thought about it. Maybe it'll happen. Uh, wasn't sure to what scale, what magnitude, but I think we found out that scale and magnitude pretty quickly here. And so one of the questions you mentioned was having the uh, adequate supply of PPE. Uh, you talked about purchasing those. And so for some of our panelists, the question is uh, securing PPE. Are you able to find adequate PPE? Are there resources available out there uh, for that personal protective equipment? I'll start with uh, Chief Davis. Well, um, I guess I can, I can echo what the good sheriff said. Uh, back in February, I put in a very large order of N95 masks, even though we already had, I'm not going to tell you how many we have, because uh, <laughs> we, have, we have more than a whole lot of uh, uh, folks in, in my area, that's for sure. And I don't want folks to start pilferaging off of me. But um, we uh, we put in a, another order, a back order, even though um, we are, we're doing well as far as N95 masks, surgical masks and whatnot. Uh, however, our order, our larger order uh, that we put in has been intercepted. This is an order that we already had a PO number for and spoke to the vendor and everything. And now that, that order is being parceled to us. So um, we believe that um, there's probably been some controls as far as what's coming into the country and who gets it first and so on. But we are still in communication with our vendor. 
Uh, we're not panicking because, like I said, we saw the clouds on the horizon and we had already um, had a nice stock of N95 masks. Um, and also, um, the sheriff, he hit it on the head. Good leadership is always about planning ahead of time and preparing your folks for what could happen. Um, we do the exact same things. We, we ordered um, the infrared temperature um, checkers. We, we ordered enough for our precincts and for our police headquarters. You can't come to work unless you get checked uh, every day. And we were ahead of the city. Now our, our city government and, and other individuals and other departments are beginning that too. But these are things that we started um, early on. But as far as equipment is concerned, I know if this pandemic continues to go on and we stay in the same state, we are all going to be in need of that, that next order or that back order. So we do need our federal partners and anybody else who can help us ensure that our first responders are equipped and not put at risk. Director Bird, how about you? Uh, are you able to get enough PPE for your staff? We are actually, I mentioned that uh, incident management group, uh, which provides the resources and those resources move to a warehouse environment. And based on the head count and anticipated head count, the resources come from that, um, from that centralized point. But there is anticipation in terms of going forward, what this is going to look like, because we have a number of officers who are not able to work because of underlying um, health conditions and or because of their DOB. So we're looking forward to that as well in terms of the reconstitution conversations we're beginning to have. So the direct answer to the question is yes, absolutely, we do have sufficient numbers, but, but as the chief has, has pointed out, should this go on or as this goes on, resources are gonna have to be redefined and reallocated. And again, we'll be working toward making sure that we are keeping people safe at the front line and others, our other partners will have to make determinations as well. And particularly the larger partners with whom we deal in the airline industry and in airport administration. So yes, sufficient numbers now, absolutely. Thank you all. We'll take a couple of the questions that are in our queue. One of them that has come up is asking about resources and benefits that your agency may have accessed uh, using CARES Act. Uh, and so, I know there may or may not be some benefits there. Uh, does anybody know if your agency has been able to access or receive any benefits as a result of the CARES Act? Not a, yeah, not, did you say yes, Mary? I did. Okay. I did, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt, I did. Go, go ahead, Director Bird. But you know, it, it's specific to um, some levels of PPE relative to N95s um, particularly, but also um, the cost of sanitizing checkpoints in, in this instance. When a person has been diagnosed and there is a tiered sanita sanitizing process that needs to occur, and so some funding is available to reimburse as a result of the CARES Act, yes. Thank you. Uh, Sheriff McFadden, I'll give you the next question. It has to do with, uh, we've seen in some states, some counties where uh, the detention centers and jails have released some of their nonviolent offenders. Uh, what have you seen there in Mecklenburg and kind of what are your thoughts on that as an option to help reduce risk for both those uh, in the facility and personnel? Well, that is um, something that it is a national conversation and I, I welcome it every every day. And what I simply tell the legal um, side of that is that here in Mecklenburg, we are releasing on, on the traditional ways that people are released from jail or detention center, 54 every day. But here's what we try to tell the community and everybody else. We can release 54, but you can't have 34 come in on the arrest side part of it. So we are asking our faith community, we're asking our local uh, politicians, we're asking anybody to send a message out to simply not have our communities committing crime. If they can do that, we will reduce our population drastically. In the beginning of this pandemic, all property crime, every crime went down because everyone was home and everybody got comfortable. And I think that we continue to address this message out into the public. Look, let's let for this particular time, let's reduce the crime. 
So we are releasing people, but on the on the traditional way. So we're not releasing them because of the pandemic crisis. So we have 54 go out, but 34 come in every day. So if we can simply slow down the crime in our community, you know, we will see the, uh, the reduction in the population. But also the, the problem that we have in most of these facilities that I don't have, we have single cell confinement. And after single cell confinement, we also have what they call a wet cell where everyone has their own bathroom and their own sink. And so if we want to quarantine our men and women, we simply just close the doors and everybody's quarantined. But also we would have to plan, which a lot of us didn't do in, in the beginning. We took one of our pods, which is a 54 um, bed pod, and we had that as our quarantine pod. So we sterilized it, cleaned it, and then we kept that open just in case if we have to quarantine some people, we will put them into that facility. So planning ahead was essential. And I think that's what if we haven't learned anything else is we sit back every day and plan for this epidemic to come back during the winter or come back during the fall. Because if you listen to the CNN and the doctors, this is a wave and it is going to continue for a time. But the population is critical. Um, and that's why you need, you need to ensure the families that you are doing everything for them. That's why we open up the hotline to the spouses and the parents to say, hey, listen, forget about what the people are saying in the streets. Talk to your sheriff and your sheriff can directly tell you what's going on. And I have three staff members. If a mother calls me, I email that staff member, say check on Joe, and then they're going to tell me how Joe, and I send that message back to Joe's mother. I can tell you that sends a great message to the community, and it stops some of the rumor, some of the rumor mill when you have it. But just uh, the population, um, it should go down, and you know we just have to look at how can we prevent it from spreading inside. Cleaning is essential. Reducing the traffic is essential. And then really, town hall meetings, I know that sounds crazy, but town hall meeting with these residents saying, listen, if you see a, if you see a detention officer coughing, you need to tell somebody because he's now infecting your pod. And believe it or not, that has worked for us. And that's why we only have two employees and they'll be back to work and we have no spread inside of our detention center. Well, that's great. It sounds like there's a great relationship that you've established and rapport with uh, both those who are your residents as well as your personnel to establish that safe zone for them. Uh, one of the things that came up and that you all may have uh, input on uh, from our audience was your interaction with school districts and universities. Uh, kind of what are you looking at and how that may be engaging? Even uh, uh, Director Hilton, you know, what is it we're looking at from that larger scale uh, as we try to manage uh, school districts across the country and what may be a safe environment? And so for Superintendent Ferguson, and Chief and Sheriff, uh, are you working with your local school districts, your universities that may be uh, in your jurisdiction? to try to establish some type of rapport with those police departments and that university administration, because those dorms on those university campuses uh, can certainly be a Petri dish for this as well. And so we wanna, uh, the audience is asking kind of what may be there. I'll start out uh, with uh, Superintendent Ferguson. What are you all kind of working on in New Orleans regarding their relationship and, and discussion with the school district as well as universities? Thank you. So throughout the school year period, we have a phenomenal relationship with our university leaders as well as our school board leaders. Uh, currently, the, the governor has closed all schools. So all our universities, their students have returned home. Um, our kids are doing uh, what they can uh, on devices from home. They're, they're, they're doing learning uh, exercises from their residences. Uh, so we really don't have any issues with that. Uh, I have a few MOUs with several of our universities in our, within New Orleans that work with me with regards to patrolling their, their immediate neighborhoods surrounding their uh, campuses. So they coordinate with my various district captains to make sure that we're still providing that presence as well as emphasizing that, that stay at home mandate as best as we can working together so that we all can get through this together. But we really do not have any issues with the schools because they are all closed right now. We actually partnered up with them to do some uh, taking advantage of opportunities to feed uh, some of the students uh, that are out of school right now. Uh, we're using, so we are a charter school uh, city, with, which means that you do not have to live in a district to go to your school. But what we're doing is, if a school is in your neighborhood, you can go to that school and, and, and obtain a meal. They're, feed, they're doing uh, two feedings a day, and we are participating in that and assisting 
with providing uh, food to the kids uh, while they are learning uh, from home. Thank you. How about you, Chief Davis? Uh, working with the local university, uh, got a couple of them there in Durham. Working with those universities as well as the Durham Public Schools? Uh, absolutely. We are um, actually participating in the same type of activities. Our our Police Athletic League, of course, they, they don't have any programs going on, our Community Services Division. So, you know, instead of sending officers home, we use them in, a, in another capacity. So we, we have started partnering up. With, we have NCCU, um, North Carolina Central University here, Duke, UNC, uh, NC State, all of these colleges, their students are gone. And um, instead of them furloughing law enforcement officers, um, we're collaborating and feeding uh, kids, uh, especially those kids that depended on those, those meals every day that don't have the, the, that kind of sustenance at home. So um, a lot of the work that we're doing with our schools right now is just finding ways to contribute to the community and get through this pandemic. So a lot of you know non-traditional kind of work is being done by some of our patrol officers. Awesome. Director Hilton, uh, does FEMA have some resources that may be available to school districts? Uh, and some of our police leaders look to work collaboratively with them are there some resources that may be available to assist those school districts as they start to look at the post-COVID era? And uh, I'll yield that question to the uh, local officials because uh, FEMA, as a uh, federal agency, we do not uh, interact directly with the, with the local uh, schools. However, uh, through the, uh, through the uh, state, I'm sure if there's need for funding through some type of uh, uh, grant programs, uh, the local uh, officials can act actually apply through the states back to FEMA so that uh, that funding can be considered. But we do not uh, directly engage local uh, local schools. Thank you. Uh, recently, Noble put out a public service announcement uh, regarding domestic violence. It was National Domestic Violence Awareness Week, and Noble put out a PSA that's available on our social media outlets, and you can check it out on Facebook and uh, other outlets. But we were interested in what you may be seeing, Sheriff McFadden, in Mecklenburg County and then in our other jurisdictions regarding domestic violence and the resources that are available. One of the things we decided at Noble was that it was important to get the message out that you all are responding to those calls. There's no need to think that because you had a stay at home order that if someone needs you, you're not your your uh, officers and deputies won't come. And so are you seeing some trends regarding domestic violence? Domestic violence is on the rise, and I'll, I'll tell you, it's on the rise in everybody's city, whether you know it or not. And we took advantage of every opportunity that we can possibly take advantage of. And to piggyback on that, how we got to still reach our residents, uh, when I became sheriff, I created a community engagement team of 12 people. They do nothing but work in the community every day. So believe it or not, my community engagement team feeds all of our kids, 500 kids per day that who's living in the hotels with their families. So that's an opportunity to, to knock on that door, leave that box of food, but also check on them to see if they're going through a domestic violence situation. And then you can hand that pamphlet while you're handing that food. But then I also, again, piggyback on our partners who say that they are our partners doing the good times. You're going to have to get with them in the bad times. And you simply tell the churches, if you're not inside a service on Sunday morning, you still can broadcast the service, but talk about domestic violence. Put out a PSA for domestic violence, and that's what I did early in um, the the uh, pandemic. But then you also tell you kind of tell your churches, tell them to check on your your um, parishioners, and that will slow some of it down. But we're still going to have the problem of domestic violence. But it is something that we need to stay on, something that we need to talk about, and don't take it for granted that they are, are going to get help after um, this pandemic is over. But domestic violence is on a rise at this time because. No one can go to help them. You know, they can't be taken out of the home. So we need to make sure that our PSAs that we are doing that always talk about domestic violence and that'll slow it down. But simply us having the ability to feed these um, men and women and their children inside the hotels gave us the advantage to give that pamphlet and also check on the families at the same time. So you kind of have to use it both ways. Thanks. Any of our other panelists want to jump in on the uh, question regarding domestic violence? Well, in our jurisdiction, we have seen uh, a bit of an uptick in domestic violence. And uh, under the circumstances, you know, we can kind of, 
you know, expect that, I guess, people are, you know, um, at home with the abuser. It doesn't matter who it is, a male or a female, but um, folks are, are in that space right now with and, and a lot of tensions, and not just between husbands and wives or significant others, but w between children and parents. Uh, we've had some shootings recently where, you know, some young people and, and parents have actually had altercations that uh, ended fatally or with serious injuries. So uh, domestic violence is one of the most difficult um, types of offenses is that, uh, that there is to, to, to be proactive and prevent. Um, so uh, we ensure that our officers go through lethality assessment training, which uh, helps our officers sort of identify uh, signs of potential um, for violence in a home on just regular calls to try to intercept. But of course, the pandemic has prevented us from even being able to go to and have those kinds of interactions um, you know, with, with um, individuals that who could, who could potentially uh, become a victim. So a lot of complicated and a lot of um, very complex uh, kind of issues that we're dealing with right now. Thank you. Director Bird. got a question from our audience asking, uh, what do you think about travel and what that may look like in the future um, after this pandemic? Well, what will that look like? I'm, I'm curious myself. I, I go through a security check and it's already been uh, pretty severe, but now going through and doing something different, what that may look like uh, moving forward. Uh, what is your thoughts on that? Well, first, I'd like to visit about um, after the pandemic. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that after is going to be, but I will share, of course, anyone who uh, has to travel currently, or at least through airports, is seeing a difference in the volume of passengers who are coming through. Uh, there are changes to our operation that are necessary relative to protecting our staff, but also with the uh, social distancing that needs to happen in the queue as a person awaits uh, the opportunity to go through security screening. Um, I look forward to the continued discussions with our partners and particularly in the aviation industry as to what the practices will look like as in terms of uh, making reservations, boarding passengers, seating of passengers, and that kind of more routine process that occurs after a person goes through security screening. Um, I think the changes that we have made necessarily, uh, while they are visible to the public, we have made no changes at all in terms of the standard operating uh, procedure that needs to happen, as I mentioned earlier, to keep planes in the air. And we do have to keep our staff um, focused like a laser on this mission. And despite uh, the current volume of passengers coming through, there is no lesser focus or intent on that SOP just because of the, uh, the lower number of folks who are coming through. The enemy doesn't ever take a break and may see this as an opportunity assuming what is not true, and that is officers being unfocused as to the mission. So I think we will see a, um, a build and a slow build toward uh, pre-pandemic travel, I think it may take a longer period of time than we might assume. We have to watch it, we have to be prepared for it, and we need to stay connected to and will stay connected to our to our partners. I think that the, the rail industry um, and those who use commuting, uh, who are commuters on rail or in public transportation in major cities, those changes are going to be um, easy to see. I don't know what the changes will be in terms of those transit systems. However, we are constantly in contact with the um, with the MARTA, which is our local train system here. We do have a station in the airport and just because of partnerships that have pre-existed, um, we're able to provide information to that local transit organization and they are able obviously and glad to provide information to us as well. Uh, throughout this entire pandemic, um, I always think about what I say in terms of who you can call at three o'clock in the morning um, is the most important thing. You may know that person through meetings and working with them at three o'clock in the afternoon, but it is when you can call that person at three in the morning and their response is, what do you need? So this has been a true um, testament and rather than a test, I think, of our agility and our partnerships because all of us have invested so much in the partnerships. But the, uh, the travel question, it will continue to look different than it ever has. 
Um, and, you know, when I tell you, as I mentioned earlier, when there were 3,000 passengers coming through the airport over the course of an operations day, it's a very, very different look for us, very different look. I think we'll continue to see that for a while. Thank you. Another question that's come in for the panel, it has to do with uh, helping your personnel manage and their mental health services during uh, this time. It's an extremely stressful time. And so what types of resources may be available uh, to your personnel as they're engaged, whether it's telemedicine uh, or other options? Uh, Sheriff McFadden, are there some resources that you're making available to your uh, deputies and your staff that help them manage their stress? And then I'll come over to Superintendent uh, Ferguson and then Director Hilton. Yes, um, most people don't know that the Sheriff's Office is a, is a very unique animal. Um, we have nine chaplains, because um, we have a chaplain service already there established inside the facility. So we um, instilling them what they need to do. We are celebrating Ramadan now. And you know we're making sure that our um, residents are receiving what they need. But then we also have, which is unique to the Sheriff's offices, we also have our health care provider inside. So we have a staff of 22 people with an inside residential doctor who is there. And so we are actually talking to our staff. And if you have a problem, you know, you want to be tested so we can test you there. But we also give our staff a peace of mind that early on I went out and connected with a good friend who's a doctor here in Charlotte that had her own um, practice. And so then if one of our staff members say, well, I don't feel well and I'm kind of nervous, we can just whiz them over there to give them a peace of mind. But simply walking the halls, talking to your staff, giving your staff something to do. You know, we have um, the daily mask. Now, the daily mask is posting what your mask look like today or is it fashionable? And now we got, sorry to say, what they call the socks game. Um, I was presenting uh, one time where I actually wear some happy socks to a promotional ceremony and that became a joke. So then now it's the shoe and socks game. Let me see your socks today. And that keeps people upbeat, but simply talking to your staff, walking the halls, seeing them, you be, being a human being. Today, you know, um, my staff a, a couple of days ago, they did the TikTok challenge, whatever that may be for the ladies. And so they did it. And so it went on the radio station and the radio, local radio station posted it on the air and posted it on those websites. And now they call me tonight and said, we want to be interviewed. So small things like that help your staff. So sometimes you have to take off that superior hat and just be normal. Walk the halls, talk to them. You know, the mask of the day is, has been unique. All the sororities wear them, all the fraternities wear them, you know, and then now we're designing them. And, and next week it's going to be a whole new thing because we're going to have what they call the pandemic collection. Um, and so then that takes the sting out of it. But then also call them when they go home. Call them, you know, when they leave and you see something. I had a young lady coming to work five o'clock one morning and she struck and killed someone. And so I had to be able to see to see her. I had to talk to her and I call her every day to say, how are you doing? So being though, being that face for your staff is very important. They know you the sheriff, they know you the chief, they know you the director, but to see that just coming down and just being normal with them and wearing your mask and wearing a different mask and just talking and having fun, it takes the sting away from them. When they get there at six o'clock in the morning, they see you, talk to them while they're in line, go on the hallways and just talk to them. And I've simply that takes away from it. But establish, you know, the network of your faith community out there. They can call the churches here fed my staff um, three weeks in a row, just bringing snacks, candies, and cookies in little bags. So you reach out to them, and they think it was cute. And now today we got pizza. So I say, well, bring pizza. If you can bring 200, my staff is, will be happy. Those kind of things help them and then be personal with them. Are you all right? Is your mother all right? And then they said, if you need to take that extra day, take that extra day. But that's what we're doing as the sheriff, sheriff's office. But we also have unique because we have our own health care provider inside. And we also have a series of chaplains also taking care of our staff, including taking care of our residents. Uh, thank that. We're right at our 930 hour. And I know I was trying to toss the questions around, but I also want to be respectful of time. But I also want to give folks the opportunity to come back to the next time that we get together for this type of discussion. And so 
Uh, on behalf of Noble, I would like to thank each of our panelists as well as our audience for participating in this evening. Uh, if you would, follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We'll be posting about our upcoming panels, our webinars, what we're discussing. And we certainly want to hear from our members and our audience. What do you want to hear about so that we can produce quality programming that helps you more effectively uh, do your job? So uh, to Director Hilton, Superintendent Ferguson, Director Bird, uh, Chief Davis, as well as Sheriff uh, McFadden, thank you so much for participating with us this evening. We certainly appreciate that. Many thanks to our sponsor, FirstNet, built by AT&T, for helping us put together this program and bring it together. I encourage you to visit us at www.noblenational.org and join us at Noble. Thank you again for our panelists and thanks for attending.